This lecture and the two periods we're going to talk about, the Muromachi and the Momoyama period, are fairly important in developing Japanese culture and the art that we're going to look at. So this will help us out with the rest of the Japanese section. So the Muromachi period, um, at the end of the 14th century until about 1573. So in 1274 and 1281, the Japanese had repelled the Mongols. If you remember, the Mongols had successfully conquered China and ruled as the Yuan dynasty. During this time, Japan was ravaged, and there was civil strife and unrest, as you might expect, when foreigners are invading the island, people start to lose confidence in leadership. But later Japanese saw this as kind of a turning point in Japanese history when one of the Mongolian fleets had crossed the, the bay of, in Japan from China. They were blown away by this, probably a typhoon, but they had a particular name for the wind that blew it away, and that was kamikaze, the divine wind. So later, Japanese fighter pilots had used that name for certain types of attacks. So in 1392, the Ashikaga shogunate from Muromachi, hence the name of the period, there was little centralized power during this time, as is pretty typical for most of Japanese history you looked at. The power is located in the feudal lords, the daimyo and the samurai. And the samurai find Zen particularly compelling, uh, for many reasons, because of the focus on decisive action, but also the master-disciple relationship. This time is often called the time of sudden lords, meaning people had been able to, daimyo had been able to conquer some areas, and then immediately were conquered by others. So a lot of rising and falling is quickly happening during this period. When we look at painting, the most famous and probably one of the most famous painters um, in all of Japanese history is Sashu Toyo. He came from a samurai family, but his parents realized really early on that he was not going to be a samurai. He was more of an artist. So they sent him to a monastery where he studied. And at the monastery, that didn't work for him either. He didn't have the discipline or the interests in the types of things that monks had to do. So he was punished often. And there's this famous story where he had been punished and the punishments could be quite cruel at that time. They had tied him to a post in one of the prayer rooms and then another monk would bring him food uh, and, and water. So sometimes these punishments would last for days. And one day the monk came in to feed Sashu and he was taken aback because he saw on the floor there was a mouse. But then he looked a little bit more closely, and as he did, he saw Sashu's toe, and a bit dripped down his toe, and he dotted the end of the mouse tail, and he realized that he had painted this with his own tears. So kind of an emo type of story, but I'd promise that when we had the beginning section in Japan. So he was what's called a gaso, which is a Zen priest painter, and they're making most of the famous works during this time. He had traveled to China from 1468 to 69, and he made copies of Ma Yuan, so we'll compare the two in a moment. This style of painting in Japan is called haboku, which means broken ink. So let's get a little bit closer into that painting and take a look at it compared to Ma Yuan. So what I suggest you do in the extra credit board is check out um, or make comments about what you think are some similarities here and then what are some differences. And this will hopefully help you understand these styles for the test. So in it, it says, my, my eyes are misty and my spirit is exhausted. So a little bit of this romantic tragedy is something that you see in a lot of the stories of Japanese artists. They called this style of painting shin, so these jagged slashing brushstrokes, which was originally uh, used to describe calligraphy. And in some ways it is calligraphic, but we do see a lot of washes and thick colors. So the Onin War from 1467 to 77 destroyed Kyoto. And sometimes, occasionally I'll see scholars 
looking at this and saying, and saying that his experience in own and war is part of the reason why these pieces are aggressive or melancholy or whatnot, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think the stylistic influence from people like Ma Yuan and the types of things that have been going on in calligraphy are just as likely to be able to influence Sashu. Certainly, though, maybe the stories that are somewhat tragic about Sashu may be influenced by the experiences that not just Sashu had, but uh, others during the Onan War. I promised you a painting eventually that would be a Zen Cohen, and this is the one that we came up with. It's probably a Cohen, but we don't know the particulars of it. But you can un kind of understand why people would think it was a Cohen. Uh, just think about, okay, we have all these ants, and there's that big old pumpkin. Ants are super strong, but do they have any chance of being able to drag this pumpkin? Probably not. But what we see is the ants being very disciplined and going through with it anyway. If that's something that is part of the Japanese character, its cultural character is what I'm talking about, that even if something is impossible, you go through it anyway in a disciplined, um, organized way. So when we look at these, we can see kind of similar to the video that we looked at before about the great Grand Shrine in Ishe, in Ise, when people were taking all the logs and dragging them to the river and then floating them down the river, we had a man leading them that looked exactly like our, our leader on top of the pumpkin. And then we can see people with all the ropes working together and even musicians to keep a rhythm of it happening. So the reason why it's a koan is because it's an impossibility, probably um, a contradiction. Again, if you're looking for something on an extra credit board, tell me what is missing from these ants. And then think about if there's a movie that you've seen that use the same type of technique to anthropomorphize ants. So the style that we saw in China of this kind of accidental type style of painting where you might do the same piece a thousand times and then one turns out just right from the Southern Song Dynasty is what we see a lot of in this Haboku splash ink style of painting. This particular one is a kakemono, which means a wall-mounted mounted scroll. And remember when we talked about in China, ink and paper makes it easier for people to do these types of pieces. And since it was widely available, this style became more popular, or perhaps because it was widely available, this style was able to develop. So O'Reilly says that in this one, it's a dialogue between the memories of the artist and his brush, paper, and ink. So there's actually a figure in this painting. <clears throat> if you haven't seen it yet, there he is. Just a few lines to define this particular figure. So this is, is Jonin Itetsu. They call the art that's made by monks like this, Zengo, the art of monks. An immediate translation of the inner experience of the artist's mind into an external form. So again, it's kind of like immediate type of style. Jonan Itetsu was the 183rd abbot of the Tofukuji Temple in Kyoto. And you'll find that a lot of these artists tend to be prominent in other ways. Who's being pictured is Hote, who has many names, uh, and it comes from Mahayana Buddhism. He's a legendary 10th century Zen monk, uh, kind of an itinerant Santa Claus. He's a Buddha of the future, so in uh, Mahayana Buddhist styles, they have this idea of a Buddha and then a pantheon of Buddhas in the past and the future uh, with deep time in both the past and future, or Moroku in disguise. So I'll read what this guy is all about, but he's kind of like a Zen person. And this is kind of like a koan in a way. So Bujai, that's another name for the same person. I said, the travel giving candy to the poor children, only asking a penny from Zen monks or lay practitioners he meets. One day a monk walks up to him and asks, what is the meaning of Zen? 
Budai drops his bag. How does one realize then? He continues. But I then takes up his bag and continues on his way. So kind of like this, oh, I didn't tell you that one. Uh, but a koan I usually tell in class is along a similar idea. So the idea with this is um, do the right thing in the right moment. And sometimes those things can be somewhat random. So the figure is done in a kind of jolly way. You can see why uh, the Ohio link is giving that type of description. So Zen Gardens, uh, we used to have an example in the library. We can't go to the library anymore um, because of the pandemic. So the Zen Gardens are designed originally. So this one, so Ami, uh, so Ami is who died in 1525, is the original designer of it. But over time, it changes because these are obviously living. Uh, even the stones may change in, in form. So part of what Zen gardens do is, first off, they're in a cloister in uh, monasteries, most of the famous ones. So only monks can enter these areas. That's why it's kind of difficult to find pictures. Uh, tourists can see it, but they have to see it from a courtyard. Um, an inner kind of courtyard railing uh, on a different level than, than the garden itself. And the idea is to show, um, kind of illustrate in three dimensions, the concept of Maya in imagination versus reality. Because remember with Maya, it means that form is emptiness. Um, the profane world is something that is not real. That also means that physical things can be anything else. You can take your mind and you can modify them to whatever you want. So think about this one, look at it, and can you see some qualities that are like a landscape? Especially if we can compare it to, you can compare it to Fan Kwan that we looked at a little bit earlier on. So what most students say when we do this in class is this looks like a bridge, perhaps over some water, uh, and then we have these kind of granite towers that are like Huangshang Mountain. So similar to what we saw with Fan Quan travelers amid mountains and streams. So depending on what angle you see it from and what time of year you see it from and how it's been maintained recently, it can take on a different, entirely different character. So kind of like when talking about Zen art, the idea is that when you use words to describe things, they get in the way of understanding, as O'Reilly says. So remember that journey I talked about with the Zen person. As a baby, you experience things wholly because you don't know the words for things. Then you learn the words for things, and there's a separation between you and things. And then as the Zen person evolves through time, they get back to that direct experience as a baby, but with the wisdom of the study through their life. The Momiyama period is a very short period, but considered by some Japanese historians to be the most important in the development of what would eventually become modern Japan. So Momiyama means Peach Hill, was originally founded by Oda Nobunaga, who dies in 1582, and he's replaced by someone who's far more important. It's an orchard on the destroyed castle of the Japanese autocrat Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He was a peasant who became a shogun, a dictator of Japan, and he's considered to be one of the most important figures in Japanese history. So for in standardized American history, uh, people often look at Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or somebody as important. Think of uh, Hideyoshi as both of these rolled up into one. During this time, a little bit before this time, but it was certainly in full swing, there were Christian missionaries that came um, many of them Jesuits, like we talked about before in China. And as we talked about before in China, people in um, colonized places or potentially colonized places like Japan had very good reason <clears throat> to be skeptical of Christian missionaries. Often Christian missionaries were just one arm of a multi-pronged attack that ended in colonialism. But uh, originally a shogun accepted some of the Christian missionaries and thought maybe you could use it like other Christian leaders had to unite a bunch of warring factions. But Hideyoshi uh, saw the danger in Christianity as taking away Japanese culture and by doing that, making them more susceptible to imperialism. 
and they turned out to be right. Um, so one of the things he did is he gathered up some of the missionaries, Portuguese and uh, many Japanese nuns and priests who had converted, and he had them. He had a mass execution with them with crucifixion. You can look up if if you have a morbid curiosity, you can look up uh, what Japanese crucifixion is. It's not the same as the crucifixion the Romans used on Jesus, but uh, Hideyoshi surely knew of the kind of um, connection between what he was doing to these martyrs and Christ uh, and kind of used that. So 26 of them were murdered, and more or less, that was the end of Christianity in Japan. So maybe it had an effect on why Jap- Japan was never uh, colonized. Um, it certainly helped um, to be able for the Japanese to not uh, to have a religions that are other than Buddhism local to them. So there was a decline of Buddhist patronage during this time. So for some of the same reasons we saw in China, a lot of daimyo saw their um, the Buddhist monasteries as having too much power as this kind of bureaucracy that the shogun couldn't control. So what we see during this time period is very interesting and it's kind of reflective of what's going on politically. On one hand, we see the somewhat delicate uh, Chinese style buildings like we're looking at with the Himeji Castle, but they have a secret. Uh, and that's because before this time, uh, the Japanese may have been using gunpowder for, for weapons, um, but when they saw how effective it was with the way the Westerners were using it, it became more common during this time period. So if you have guns and cannons, you can't have these castles that are good for defending against non-explosive items. So this one called the White Heron Castle, and since we're here in Michigan and you can see those, hopefully you're seeing them uh, taking some time during the pandemic to go on hikes. You can see the color scheme is the same as herons uh, and the kind of curves and wings like we had talked about in China as well. So the White Heron Castle, but it has a secret these giant fortifications. So again, if somebody were to lob a cannonball in there, it would assure you that the entire building wouldn't be destroyed. So this looks kind of like awkward when you see it from this angle, but again, necessitated by the use of new weapons. But there is additional types of defenses. There are multiple moats. You can see one of them, one of them here. And then if attackers were to try to reach the castle, they would have to make their way up this hill and the trees and rocks would make it so that it would be very difficult to get up there quickly. So from up there, they could be picked off by archers and gunners. On the inside, you have things that are quite ostentatious. So the style of the architecture that we see on the interior here of these castles and on the exterior is um, very dense and full of wealthy materials. And that's gonna be a big contrast to something else that develops during this period, and that's the tea houses. So kind of pay attention to this one. To complete the image, it is important to imagine the hall filled with portable works of art, courtiers dressed in colorful embroidered silks, the realms of flowers and music. So think about when we talked about the Tang Dynasty, just an overwhelming amounts of color and design and density. We'll talk about these gold Biobo screens in a little bit. So gold uh, had taken on a little bit of the meaning that it had in the West and that it was a symbol of wealth and power. These Biobo screens, they have a gold leaf background and the style is in a Southern Song style, but a little bit more linear. It's not as much um, space that we necessarily see. In this style, this kind of sub-style is called the Kano School because of the founders and his grandson, Aitoku. These types of screens, which are called Biobu, Biobu, became very popular not just in Japan, but also in China and in Asian export markets. So um, in Chinese communities in the West, like uh, there was a pretty big one in Mexico City at this time, um, with some wealthy Chinese people, uh, these types of screens were exported. 
there. So yes, I said Chinese. Um, they were interested in this style. It's obviously a very Chinese style despite um, being developed in Japan. You can compare to what's going on with Ma Yuan, which is roughly contemporary. There is some overlap, I think you can see, uh, with the way that the branches kind of mix into the background, almost prefiguring um, the French artist Cezanne's uh, passage. But there is kind of a more solidity to the Biobos, which part of which comes from materials, but it also says something about the time period that they're in. Some of these biobus are um, showing kind of everyday life and people would collect these and sometimes they'd be installed like we saw in the White Heron Castle. Other times you could use them as room dividers or whatnot. So Tartar Envoys, uh, that's a kind of outdated name for Mongols. Arriving ships, their advance party ashore. The way that Japanese would often treat foreigners uh, is not so well. This one, they're treated relatively well. But foreigners from the West, who they called uh, Nam, Namban, which means Southern Barbarians. And remember, the reason why they called them that is because the Portuguese originally came from the South and landed at Nagasaki. The Japanese were fascinated by the types of, <clears throat> the types of technology that the Portuguese had. Uh, and you can see them kind of landing at the port here. So they had a fascination with them, but when you see them, you know, they don't really have the conventions to be able to portray Westerners, so it doesn't necessarily relate to Westerners. Eventually, when we get to the Edo period, we'll see that these docks at Nagasaki were the only places that um, Japanese and Europeans could interact with each other, and then in very limited ways, which we'll talk about as we go on. So on the other hand, away from these kind of ostentatious displays of power and wealth, we see the tea house, but it's important to realize that they're being commissioned by the same people. So the shogun commissioned this particular tea house, and he's the same person that's commissioning all this over kind of decorated and ostentatious type of art in the castles. So both of these things, both of these kind of elements and ways of thinking of of the world were thought to be important by people with power. So chashitsu are tea houses. Chanoyu is the tea ceremony, which unfortunately, again, because of the pandemic, we're not able to see this semester, but I'll describe a little bit of how it goes on. The idea with the tea ceremony is that, and we already saw this in earlier periods in Japan, we were talking about the high end period, is it's almost a living theater. So the tea ceremony at this time was just for elites. And even now, there, there's a lot of um, kind of segregation between the classes when it comes to tea ceremonies. But the elite uh, would come in and they would behave in such a way that uh, is completely controlled at all times. If you were to say something, you would expect to say very little and have spaces between your words and what other pe people had said and everything you say would be profound and concise as possible. And every way that you move would also be profound and concise. So a little bit of this way of thinking comes from Zen philosophy, although the kind of elite nature and super controlled nature of it may seem away from what we normally have in Zen. There are some of those, what we normally studied in Zen, there are some of those kind of contradictions between things that we see displayed in it. So a big difference between this and the, the tea houses and the castles, you can see the tea house is as simplistic as possible. Um, there's nothing there. We just have uh, rugs for people, pillows for people on the floor, and then we'll look at the niche that's on the side of the building. So it's intentionally simple, intentionally rustic, but also refined. The, to go along with the theater aspect, whenever you do a tea ceremony, you don't enter the space like you would a normal space. Instead, they would usually have, and it's not really shown here, you would only be able to get into the tea house through a very kind of narrow opening where you would have to bend over um, and you were expected to face forward during a certain time and then backwards during another time. So even your entryway into the building would be a type of theater um, 
But again, it's not pre-prescribed. The way that you're expected to act would be original, um, but profound. So the tokonama, which is the niche, this is often when you have museum or gallery displays of the tea houses. This is often what they'll have. Uh, the idea with the tea ceremony is that it's supposed to develop wabi-sabi. So wabi is humility, honesty, and integrity, and sabi is stillness, and the old and the rustic over and new. But again, when you see these niches, they're rather refined. Um, you have this calligraphy. And if you were going to look at the calligraphy and you would be expected to, even though no one would say so, you would go over to the niche, um, perhaps um, burn some of the incense there and look at it for just the right amount of time, not too short, not too long, and then say something short, original, profound. So there's a very high pressure type of environment uh, despite developing, you might not think of Zen to be that way, but it's certainly this way in, uh, in this particular ceremony. So the idea with Wabi Sabi is, and this is from, um, I don't do Portuguese, so I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. This is a Jesuit priest who lived in Japan and he learned Japanese and learned Japanese culture, culture and was accepted by the Japanese over time, which is a, a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so he said the idea with this tea ceremony is to produce courtesy, politeness, modesty, moderation, calmness, peace of body and mind without pride or arrogance, fleeing from all ostentation, pomp, external grandeur, and magnificence. So the opposite of what we saw in the previous slides, um, the palaces and the way that people would act inside of the palaces. So the types of implements that they had for the tea ceremony would also be wabi-sabi. They'd be following these ideas. So chashitsu um, is the container that you make the tea in. And the type of tea that they have for the tea ceremony is different than tea that, that you would normally have for um, green tea. So green tea, if you're not aware, it's the same plant as black tea, but it is not roasted. Uh, so as a result, it has a very kind of delicacy to it. Normally how green tea is pay made for every day, both in China and Japan, is with water that is not boiling, uh, so not too hot, and just the whole leaves, and it's only steeped for a minute or so, and then you have this kind of balanced delicacy to it. The tea ceremony tea is different. Um, the tea is ground into a fine powder, um, and it's mixed right in front of you during the tea ceremony. And even this mixing, which would be done by the host, would be very practiced, but it's supposed to look kind of original. So it would be this like kind of ritualistic type of move. And um, shibui, which means bitter but pleasing, describes the type of tea. When you grind it into a fine powder and have very hot water, it's an astringent, quite strong tasting tea. And um, that's considered to be valued. Uh, it goes along with the wabi-sabi idea. The, the old over the new have this like kind of powerful and bitter tea. <clears throat> so even the serving implements are like this. A lot of them you see, uh, if any of you have done ceramics, you look at this and you're probably thinking, wow, this is really simple. Uh, it's just slab-sided clay and form with their hands. So again, we're kind of valuing the rustic and the old over the new. But at the same time, there's a lot of refinement. So these um, glazes, which are some are the results of which some are considered to be more auspicious than others. And then refinement in the handle here. So you can see how the handle has indentations. So if you were to hold this with all of your other equipment in here, uh, you'd be able to keep it in place. So oftentimes these uh, implements for the tea ceremony would be commissioned from famous artists that do paintings and other things. And for they'd be made specifically for the person that is the host and the owner of the tea set. So this was probably, and, but no, nobody, the commissioner wouldn't tell you. <laughs> They'd tell you what, you what you wanted, but they wouldn't tell you the specifics. 
So the artists would figure out, okay, what do they need? You know, and they would kind of make it so these indentations probably fit exactly uh, who it was commissioned by. So the tea bowls, and um, if you're thinking of the types of teacups that they have, sometimes in uh, modern Asian American uh, restaurants where they're super tiny, that's not what this is. Uh, this is a bowl. It's a big, rather big bowl. And I participated in a couple of tea ceremonies, um, including one at CCS. And um, the, it was kind of funny. The, it was from the Japanese Women's Club in Detroit. And she had brought some tea bowls. And she had said that they weren't the best ones they have. Um, and she was just honest about it. She said, well, we brought the best ones to the Japanese embassy for the special kind of ceremony with some leaders. But, um, you know, you all aren't that important. <laughs> She didn't say it exactly like that, but she was pretty straightforward about it. So these pieces, um, which are made by, you can see this one's made by Koetsu, who we talked about before, by very famous artists. But again, they appear kind of crude, um, but it has an elegant simplicity. This particular one, there's even cracks in it. It's totally slab-sided. Uh, and But you can see how the bowl kind of has this, a little bit of this lip. And you hold it at the top there. So the, this probably fits the hands of, of exactly who uh, it was commissioned for. So you use the two hands with the bowl on each side. This particular bowl is made in the Anagama Kilns, uh, which is underground in a hillside uh, where you can get lots of different temperatures in, in your kilns for different types of products. So the, there is, and then this was mentioned whenever... Um, I did the tea ceremony before. There's considered to be a good side to the tea bowl and the other side. So the good side is considered to be the most auspicious view, the kind of like greatest art with these, these patternings that you see here. So whenever you're in a tea ceremony and you're next and everything is, is a hierarchy. So the person who has the host, they have kind of a guest of honor, they get served first. And then you go down the line with less and less important people. So everybody knows this. Uh, nobody's saying that out loud, but everybody knows where they stand. And then they definitely know where they stand when they get the tea served. So when the um, person pours your tea, again, in this highly kind of ritualized way, they turn the good side to you when they hand it to you. And then when you take it, um, you drink the tea. And what you're supposed to do is drink all of it um, before you put the, the bowl back down away from your face. And to ensure all the guests there that you drank all of it, at the end of the tea, you're supposed to make <sighs> So you make a sound that shows that you served up the last bit of tea. And then once you do, you can turn around the bowl to the good side and you can take a look at it. So you kind of look at the art on the good side Again, not too short of a time, but not too long of a time. Maybe make a comment, maybe not. And then when you put your tea bowl back down on the ground next to you, you turn it around so that the good side faces everybody else. So again, a very kind of ritualized way of going about things. <laughs> 